Hello and welcome to this Edexcel A-Level Geography Inquiry Question Review. Uh, today we're looking at water and inquiry question one, which as you can see there is what are the processes operating within the hydrological cycle on a global to a local scale? So as always, first thing we do is we look at the specification. This is so important as it gives us the key terms that would be used in the exam. It also shows you how the key terms are linked into the main areas of the question. So when we look, we can see that we have the key ideas. So if you get one of these key ideas in the exam, then you need to be talking about some of the areas from the detailed content. And you would be expected to use the correct terminology within your answers. Now in an explain question, it's likely that it's just going to focus on one of these main areas and it will be a need to sort of give reasons and explain the links and possibly give limited examples in there as well. For an assess or an evaluate question it's more than likely that you're going to be linking in a number of different key ideas so it may be looking at part from here and linking it to here as well. Um, and it can also link between different inquiry questions. So having a look at the specification is always vital when revising and looking over your notes. So the key for this inquiry question is looking at the global scale of the hydrological cycle and how important it is and what are the key processes and key features of it. Then moving down to a more localised scale and looking at the drainage basin of individual rivers and of regions, um, but then looking at it on a much more localised scale at individual parts within that river. Not only does it look at different scale, but it can look at different times as well. So where we're talking about things like water budgets, soil budgets um, and hydrographs and river regimes, we could be looking at any things from over a number of years through to a number of dates. So it's important that we understand which relates to which. So if we start off with the mind map, here we can see how everything is linked together. So we've got the global system, the drainage basin systems over here, and then we've got the how the cycle links to water availability, looking at budgets, river regimes, and storm hydrographs. So if we take them bit by bit to start off with. So the global hydrological system, this is a closed system because there are effectively no inputs or outputs. Now, the main reason that the global hydrological system works is because of the two main driving forces, solar energy, heat and radiation from the sun. And this is what causes the water to rise and evaporation and transpiration. We then have gravity, which is what leads to precipitation. It leads to the water to fall again. Solar energy is also important because it can set up the climate zones and the global atmospheric circulation, which is also important for the different amounts of water we find in different areas. So they're the driving forces. Now, as it's a closed system, all we have basically are stores where the water will be resident and the fluxes or the processes. And so this is really simple, almost going back to sort of key stage three stuff. The main stores, places like the ocean, the atmosphere, the biosphere and the ground and the soil and the rock. Perhaps a new one, though, is the cryosphere. This is the water locked up in ice. Now, it's important to realise that most of the water is locked up in the ocean and this becomes very important when we're looking at water availability particularly for home uh, human use so we're looking at well over 97 percent is in the oceans yeah much of the water is then locked in within the cryosphere so these are the ice caps the ice sheets glaciers um, and again, some of this is accessible to humans, but only a small amount. We also have a large amount within the ground and the soil in aquifers and fossil water stores, which again, some of them can be very difficult to reach. 
Now, the water can move between these different stores in a whole range of ways, from evaporation, transpiration, precipitation, ground flow, surface runoff, infiltration. But again, remember to go back to the specification to see the key terms there. So overall, less than 1% of all water is available for human use or is easily accessible and economically accessible. Much of it is stored in the cryosphere and much of it is fossil water. And what is important is the residence times. How long does the water stay within each of these stores? Now, this will vary um, from place to place. In rivers, in small lakes, residence times will be small. In oceans, it could be thousands of years. OK, but these will all vary. Moving on, the drainage basin system. Now, here we move from global to more local. And because it's more local, it does become what we call an open system. And it's important to recognize that systems are so important in geography. It's almost like a manufacturing process is that you have your inputs at the start of it. You have your processes, the things which change it. And then you will have the outputs, what comes out of the system at the end of it. So always know, as with Coast, that there are different systems operating. <clears throat> so the main elements of the drainage basin system. We have obviously the inputs, which is mainly precipitation and the three main types, orographic uh, caused by air rising over hills and mountains, frontal, which is where we have cold air masses meeting um, warmer air masses. And this is particularly important at temperate latitudes, such as the UK. And then we also have convectional rainfall. These is, tends to be in areas or warmer, hotter areas where the land warms very quickly, forcing the air to rise, taking the water vapour with it, etc. Now, it's also important to realise there are different types and patterns of precipitation which relate to things like global atmospheric circulation. Now, although for the specification, it doesn't state that you need to know that, it is important to understand about the Hadley, the Ferrell, and the polar cells because this will help to explain the patterns of rainfall. It's also need to understand whether it's a maritime uh, or continental climate. If the main weather patterns come over the sea, it's likely to be carrying more water and wetter. If the main wind, prevailing winds come over the land, it's going to be drier. And relief linked to orographic rainfall can also be important as well. On the windward side of mountains, as the air is rising, it's likely to be wetter. But on the leeward side, where the air is sinking back down again, then it's likely to be drier. We then have all of the stores within the drainage basin, which is exactly the same as for the global um, system, just on a smaller scale. And obviously, an ocean would become an output as the rivers flow into it. We then have all of the different fluxes, the different processes which move it through. Again, evaporate, um, <coughs> sorry, ground flow, surface runoff, and all of those. The main outputs then, channel flow, evaporation, and transpiration. Yeah, the water that is um, exuded by plants. And then finally, what we need to know is what are the different factors that can affect the inputs, fluxes and outputs of the drainage basin. So obviously the climate and relief can be very important in precipitation rates. And the relief is also important into things like the processes, surface runoff, the steeper ground. It's also linking things like the soil, the geology, the rock type, how deep are the soils, because this will have an impact on things like infiltration, percolation and ground flow. The vegetation is also important in terms of infiltration, in terms of reducing or increasing surface runoff and the likely amount of water available for transpiration. We also have the human factors, things like abstraction from the ground, ideas of storage in reservoirs which could affect the drainage basin system. Agriculture and industry will also be taking water from the system and deforestation 
can have a major impact. Yeah, we've already talked about the infiltration and the transpiration rates, but forests and trees and plants are very important to a healthy water system. Then we come on to water budgets. Now, what we're looking at here is really the amount of water uh, that's available um, in the soil uh, and around the different areas. And this is very heavily based on latitude because it is what measures the precipitation versus evapotranspiration rates. And this can obviously change throughout the years. For example, in the Northern Hemisphere in temperate latitudes, precipitation may be similar all year round, but the evapotranspiration rates will be much higher in summer, leading to um, soil utilization and possibly soil water deficits in the summer months. We then also have this idea that when it gets cooler again and evapotranspiration levels fall, then the soil moisture becomes recharged until it becomes full. And then we have a surplus at the start of the year and the same goes again. Now in the Southern Hemisphere, this would be uh, the other way round in that it would be the months from sort of October through to February, where you'd have utilization and deficit and recharge from April through to October. And it's understanding these water budgets in the polar regions, places like Alaska, in desert regions, temperate regions, and the tropical rainforests, and understanding the different levels of precipitation and evapotranspiration rates. So you're looking at rainfall patterns, you're looking at climate patterns, is it in the intertropical convergence zone where there may be monsoon seasons? Um, are there some particularly cold months in polar regions? For how long is it locked up within the cryosphere? And then is there a general melting time? Then we also then start to look at a smaller scale again when we look at river regimes. This is how the flow of a river or the discharge of a river changes throughout the year. So again, links to what are the factors that affect the drainage basin? Yeah, and again, major influences are things like climate and latitude, the amount of rainfall and the amount of evapotranspiration and the water locked up in the cryosphere. So for example, in um, higher latitudes, uh, where it is sort of tundra or permafrost, you may find there is very little river flow in their winter months because the water is frozen within the cryosphere. However, as it starts to melt, there would be a sudden increase in discharge and then reducing again. In equatorial areas, particularly those in the intertropical convergence zone, where you get these monsoon conditions, then the river discharge flows may start to link to that. So we can see these peaks of discharge within the monsoon seasons. Then looking at a much smaller time scale and looking at how rivers respond to individual rainfall events. We look at the storm hydrograph. Now again, the factors that can affect storm hydrographs of different rivers can be the same as the factors affecting the drainage basin. So that knowledge is used in many different ways. But basically we look at the rainfall and we look at the discharge of the river. And we have the number of hours after the peak of the rainfall. That's when the most rain fell. And then we can compare that to the peak discharge. Now this would give us the lag time, and this can help us to understand how likely or when rivers are likely to flood and can give warnings to people living in flood risk areas. So there we have a very quick overview of water cycle inquiry question one. And you can start to see how it links from a global to more local systems, looking at the role of the different factors affecting the drainage basin, the processes, the inputs and the stores, looking at how water budgets are affected by climate and latitude, and looking at how individual rivers flows change throughout the year and can change on a smaller scale as well. So hope that's been useful. Don't forget, keep checking with the specification. Thank you very much. See you later.